one two church my name is alan i want you to take just a second turn to somebody next to you and say good morning i'm glad you're here <laughs> Hey, we are a family. You belong here. We miss you when you're not here in person. We, we thank you for uh, attending online. We know there's people around the world watching. Uh, people are gone sometimes doing life, not to point out anybody in particular, but Scott and Corby, we're so glad you're back with us yeah. today. Yeah. If you are interested in uh, serving, connecting, getting in a group. Matt, I, Crystal, Terry, we'd love to talk to you about that. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Nathan and Sarah, and we're going to worship. Will you stand together with me as we pray? Father, thank you so much uh, that you always have been, that you always are going to be. You're here this morning with us. Accept our praise this morning. Um, be with Nathan and Sarah as they lead us in songs, worship. Be with Pastor Matt as he brings your message. Open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us today. We pray, Father, that we will look more like you every step of the journey. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Christ was born and the 
Church, I'm Pastor Matt. How great was that? Oh my gosh, I love hearing all of you singing together. Can you guys hear me okay? You good? It is a fantastic day. Um, Wendy, it's amazing. 1,800 little baby turtles released, not just today, but, but in total. How, how awesome is that to be able to, I, and I love watching the care. For these creatures this is sea turtle ink is phenomenal and i want to thank you guys it is fantastic and we have for those watching online go to sea turtle ink please and look at all the amazing things that are happening we have two birthdays as well julie joanna happy birthday so um we are in this sermon series of how to get personal with God. And if you are here for the first time, you're, you're, you're thinking, is this pastor talking like Clint Eastwood to an empty chair? Does anyone get that joke? No? Okay. Just you watch the news sometimes, please. But I want, I want um, us to actually truly get personal with the person of God, with the person of Jesus, because there, there's a lot of there, there's this large majority of my life where I looked at Jesus and I looked at God as this, this this being that was a million miles away that didn't want anything to do with my life. That he came, yes, Jesus came. That he died. Here's his imprint, and then he left. And now we're just in this this like holding pattern until we get to be with him but is he personally with me is he truly with me so the first week we we deconstructed religion where religion tells us the things that we have to do in order to get to God and the relationship that we are trying to to make clear to make known is that it's already been done that we don't need to do anything in order to get to God. That God is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. That He is in our life. That He is here. And last week I talked about how Moses went up on that mountain and came back down and gave word to the people of who God was and what He was about. And now since the veil was torn and, and the death and the, the burial and the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we can now all link arms and walk up that mountain and be personal with God. Now, I could, I could go on and on about religion. I could go on and on about your personal relationship with God, but I want to talk to you personally today where this will never make sense to you until it becomes personal to you. You can't go off of somebody else's faith. When I get, when I get in, in front of Jesus, when I take my last breath and I am there, I'm not going to have my father next to me saying, this is what I taught. Can you let him in? I won't have a pastor with me. I won't have anyone else with me. It'll be my personal relationship with Jesus. And he will look at me and say one of two things. He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. 
or depart from me, I never knew you. And so today is, it's going to be an emotional day, but when is it not for me, right? Um, somebody asked me, they, they called me this week and they said, uh, man, these past couple weeks, you have been bold about what you've been saying and you're not worried about stepping on toes. And I said, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, uh, this, I don't have time for anything else, church. I don't. I don't, have, I don't have time to worry about whose toes I'm stepping on when it comes to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't care what attacks or emails or anything that comes. I want you. This is, this is my greatest wish that all of you, all of you, would have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That is my goal. There, a bird just flew by. And I'm, I'm a little... <laughs> If you've been following my Facebook, there's a bird that there's, he's looking for me. And, and you know what's crazy? There's so many theories, and people said it's bald, baldness. No. Scott talked to me this morning, and he said that whenever he runs on my street, that bird attacks him. And he's, he just, he's got hair. Okay, so it's not this. I just think the bird's attracted to really athletic people. That's it. That's all it is. But here's where my mindset changed, church. And this may be hard to hear, and you may be like, ouch, 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 ouch. That, that really puts it in perspective. But I left, I left my pastor in 2016 to take over a church in Washington. And for five years, I had the greatest relationship with him where he called me and he would support me and he would text me and, and then cancer hit. And as a lot of you know, my hero, a father figure in my life, passed away last year. And do you know where my, my perspective changed? Was I looked back and I thought, okay, in those five years, how many times did I personally get to see him? He was busy with his church. I was busy with the church going on in Washington. And it was three times that I personally saw him. Now, here's where my mindset changed. Is I wish back in 2016, I would have known, hey, your perspective isn't that you'll have a father, a pastor in your life for five more years. I wish the perspective was, you will have three times where you meet with them. There's one. You have two left. There's two. Now this is the last time that you will see him. That's where my perspective changed. So when I come before you, in my mind it isn't, hey, I've been your pastor for a year. It is, for some of you, hey, I've had five visits with you. Now, what are we going to do with those visits? I, I think of that with every relationship. I look at my parents and think, if I see my parents once a year and they live to be another 20 years, I don't have 20 years of having parents. I have 20 visits. I have 20 personal interactions and that's where my mindset changed, where I was like, I have to be intentional with every single visit that I have with somebody because I don't know when it will be the last time. And that is why when I present Jesus, I don't care what the outside world says. I want you to know Him because this could be the last time that we visit. We don't ever know. So this is why I get passionate. This is why it's personal to me. But I want... I, in order for you, for it to be personal to you, that is between you and God, but I want to share you my, my personal relationship with Jesus. See, I, I grew up with a different Jesus. I grew up with this mindset, with this teaching, with this religion that, that believes that that Jesus is, is the Son of God and He was a good person, but He was not the God. And that He was separate from God. And this God was, was distant to me. That this, this God was out there. 
that this God came and he did, he lived a perfect life. And that's what we had to strive for is we have to be like him so that we could become like him. And I became bitter, church. I became bitter. But I thought, what will I do with this Jesus? Now, a lot of you know my story. Uh, when I share about my personal relationship with Jesus, it it doesn't have as much to do with what he's done for me as much as it is who he is, if this makes sense. So some of you may not know, but I lived a life of an um, addiction, alcoholism, six overdoses, divorce papers on the table, rehab after rehab. My daughter looking at me when she was six years old, turning my face and, and stone cold, no emotion, looks at me and says, I hate you. I wish you would move. And then in 2009, I write my suicide note in this Bible. This is the Bible that, that I have that note in to remind me of, of where God has brought me from. And this Bible is a note from my pastor. These are the two Bibles that I cherish the most here. But in 2009, my wife saved me when I had an extension cord around my throat and she wasn't supposed to be here. She wasn't supposed to be at that place at that time until the next day. So God used her to rescue me. But that is not why I follow Jesus. Because after, after God rescued me, saved our marriage, healed my relationship with my daughter, I still had to look and I, I had to say, okay, God, you want me here for something, but what do I do with this Jesus? What do I, you've changed everything in my life, but what do I do with this Jesus? Because I was taught that you weren't God. That you were a God, but not the God. And I want to show you a scripture that changed my life and it changed my way of thinking and it, it took me down this path of two years going through every religious book that there is. The Quran, the, uh, the Bible, Book of Mormon, all of it. I went through all of it because I said, I want to know this Jesus. I want to know how personal this Jesus can be in my life because my life, I got nowhere. I was nothing. The, the best I could do for myself was jail time, addiction, suicide attempt, divorce papers, all of that. that's the best that I could do. But I want to know this, Jesus. If you are willing to come into my life and save me and rescue me, what do I do with this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? And I brought, it brought me to this verse in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I still remember the exact same place I was sitting when I read that Scripture, and it hit me in a way that it never had before. And how many of you know you can read a Scripture over and over and over and nothing, and then all of a sudden you read it and you're like, what? And I read this and I was like, okay, I need to look up the original. Who is the Word? In the original, it says Jesus. It talks about Jesus. So I look at this, and, and, I, and I was sitting there, and I said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. And then I thought, okay, the Word was God. What happened to the Word? And then it goes on to uh, John 1.14. And it says, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And I thought, this, this Jesus that I've been taught that is, was a good person, a prophet, had good teachings. This guy is God? And right there it clicked. And I want to tell you why I follow Jesus and why I firmly, and I, that, that is the hill that I will die on, why I believe Jesus is not a God, not a good man, not a prophet, but God. Why I believe Jesus is God. That is the foundation of One Two Church, that we believe that Jesus was God, that He, 
he came down and put on skin and bones so that he could be an example for us and teach us and lead us and die for us and rise for us and, and then ascend to heaven. And, and the veil was torn because of him. But there were three tells that after all this, I'm like, God, I know you, you changed my life. I want to know Jesus because the Bible says that no one gets to the Father except through the Son. So if, if, if I really want to get there, I have to know, I have to know who this Jesus is. That's the goal. I need to know who this Jesus is. I, I say the word Jesus more than I do God. Why? Because it personalizes it for me. We, we, we tend to say, hey, I just thank God for all of this. And I want to get personal and talk about Jesus today. I want to talk about God that became man and changed everything. But for me, there were, there were tells, proof of why Jesus was God. Do you, do you, uh, you guys with kids know the tells that your kids give if they're lying to you? So when I was a kid, this is how my brain works. Here's just a sneak peek of my brain where there were six of us. And when something bad happened, usually it was me or my brother. It was the, the girls were fine. My older brother, he, he's, he was fine. Um, but Eric and I, and he'll be here next month. Eric and I, man, we, you give us a BB gun, a fishing pole, it, we're caught in some top ramen, you eat it crunchy. You don't cook it, you just eat it crunchy. But it, when, it, when anything went wrong, my mom would line us all up in the living room, all six of us, and she would ask the question, who did this? And she would describe it. And she always knew when it was me, and I could not figure it out. She also used the card, God will tell me if you're lying. So you should just be honest before God has to tell me. And as a kid, I'm like, okay, yeah, but that, that's me. I'm sorry. But there was this one lie that I did. And they all put us in this, this um, side room. And they're explaining. And I hear, they, the kids are all like, who did it? Just admit it. We're going to get in trouble. All of us are going to be grounded. As the five of them are talking, my, my ear is to the other room. And I hear my mom and dad say, it's Matthew. And I'm like, oh, no. How do they know? And my dad says, you're right. It's the tell. He gives the tell. And she goes, I know. He, uh, he avoids. He doesn't give eye contact. And he's very demonstrative. He's like, I, I did not do any of this as I'm looking away. And I thought, OK. Okay, so the next time I did something really bad, my parents lined us all up, and I looked at them straight in the face and said, hey, Mom and Dad, I love you. I did not do this. Super calm. And they're like, it wasn't Matthew. I'm like, nailed it. Got, I, I got it. Okay, so that's my personality is I want to know the tells. And there, there are three tells when I, when I look at Jesus being God. There's three tells that I have. Because to me, God is either a liar. Jesus is either a liar or He's Lord. That's it. There's no in-between. Either, he either lied a lot or... Everything that he said actually came to be, and that's who he is. To me, he's either liar or he's Lord. He's a lunatic if none of this is true. The Bible says that of all people, we are most foolish if Christ didn't do what he said he was going to do and rise from the dead. But the three tells that I have knowing that Jesus is God, the first one is his teachings. His teachings. So two years going through his teachings and looking at it, do you know that there's over 17,000 books written about Jesus Christ? A majority of them are those who don't even believe in who he is. Listen to me. Don't even believe, but they wrote, this is historical fact that he did this. And what's crazy to me is that 
He didn't start his public ministry until he was 30. So you have about three to three and a half years of this short ministry, the short walk, the short example for the people. And if you look at, at Scripture, there's only a handful of sermons that Jesus actually gave. Yet no one is quoted more than Jesus. Yet Jesus split linear time as we know it. Where he split, where now anyone who signs a date on anything acknowledges that Jesus split time by his birth and his death. His teachings are incredible to me. His teachings, they, they, he poured into women, he poured into children. He poured into the marginalized, those, those who were overlooked at this time. He said, no, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buck the norm and I'm going this way. And I'm, I'm going to give value to women. I'm going to give value to children. I'm going to give value to minorities. The teachings of Jesus, it shaped countries. The teachings of Jesus have informed governments, structures. I look at America. And think about how Jesus has changed, how, how, how Jesus has, has formed, and his, his fingerprints are all over the structure. What, what, what blows me away is what he taught 2,000 years ago has become so normal to some that they stop even giving him credit for the things that he said. 2,000 years ago, and love your neighbor is just accepted as the norm of something that we, we say. Something about this book is supernatural, church. I talked to my daughter once and she said, Dad, I'm trying to read this and I don't understand it. And I said, baby girl, I want you to just hold this and I want you to open it and I want you to just read the words because something supernatural happens in your soul when you read this book. The teachings of Jesus. I look, at, I look at Jesus as He starts to transform from being just a God to the God and this personal God. I look at the teachings of Jesus and I'm thinking, you have informed the highest thinkers and philosophers of today. And His words aren't easily understood. Who told you that you had to understand all of this book? Some pastor that wasn't telling you the truth. This book is, there's so much mystery and it's mystical and it's spiritual. There's so much to this. But the things that he said was, one of the things, he looks to the crowd and he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. Now, I want you, I want you to go to 2022 for a moment. And let's say this tent revival came to South Padre Island and you're like, I'm pretty interested in this. And this speaker comes up in front of everyone and he says, I want you to eat my flesh and drink my blood. How many of you are going to stick around? I'd be the first to be like, nope. See, I, I, see, I understand when Jesus says that and he turns and all the 5,000, they leave. I understand that because I'm like, that is such a wild thing to say. And then he looks over at Peter and he says, so are you going to leave too? And he's like, no, no, there's something about you, something about the way that you talk, something, something about when, when, when you speak, just the hairs stand up on my arm. Where else am I going to go, Jesus? This relationship that he has. Now, now Jesus, when he's talking about that, you, you may be here, you're like, man, we're we supposed to do that. We're taking communion today. But Jesus was talking supernaturally. Supernaturally. He's like, you will never thirst again. You will never hunger again if you have this. The second thing, I've been really stuck on this. The second thing, as I look and I realize that Jesus is God, the second thing I've been stuck on is his track record. His track record. Now, track record in today's time is interesting, isn't it? With the cancel culture and everything that's on the internet stays on the internet. And people dig, diving deep for things that you said a long time ago. And, 
this track record. You know, being a, being a public fi figure, it's weird in 2022. I'm going to be honest with you. It's weird. And I know there's some people in here that know this, where, where I'm confronted at times by people that I don't even know simply because of the title that I hold before my name. It's things that I watch on TV. I have, I have other Christians saying, well, you're a pastor, you shouldn't be doing that. And I'm thinking, you're a believer in Jesus. Remember what we talked about last week? Going up the mountain together? I am no different than you, church. I believe in Jesus. He's changed my life. The only difference is I, I have this table here and I have a microphone in my hand, but you all have the same personal relationship with Jesus. But I want to talk about track record for a moment. You want to talk about track record? Let's look at the track record of Jesus. Where Luke, I think it's the next verse, Luke 23. We're going to read a lot. But they're, 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 look at this man's track record. The whole, then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. Does anyone else think Pilates when they see this? Is it just me? No? Okay, Pilate. Now you can't unsee it. And they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah. Do you know that when we rewind back to the teachings, the, the teachings that Jesus gave, the reason why I believe he is God is because he said with his own mouth that he was God. Okay, let's be clear. Jesus said it. Jesus taught it where he said, before Abraham was, I am. I am was a word used for God in the Old Testament, and Jesus is telling him, I am God here in the flesh. But he opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis... I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus... He was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had, become en they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and once again have found no basis. Neither has no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod. So two, two rulers. For he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection into the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him. Crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But the loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. I want you to look at this, church. Pilate, Pilate, whose only loyalty is to Rome and, the, and to make the emperor look good, keeps trying to tell the people, 
where it's, it's so much so that it's inciting this mob, this riot. He's trying to tell the people, I have found nothing wrong in this man's life. I have examined this man's life and found nothing wrong. And this Pilate, whose job is to say, I'm going to do what the people say to make the emperor look great, is saying, I find no fault in this man. There has been nothing done that this man can be found guilty for. So, so you want me to release the murderer? Once again, he asks, why? This man has done nothing wrong. So now you have, you have Pilate. But now look at Matthew 27. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. He said, it is your responsibility. And all the people answered, his blood is on us and our children. How true is that statement? They didn't know what they were saying in that moment. But he's saying his blood is on us and our children. Yeah, it was. It was. And it still is today, church. His blood covers us. He said, then he released Barabbas to him. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. And then we go to, back to Luke 23. The next verse. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man. So, no, not this one. Let's go to the one after the, uh, we just read that. There we go. There we go. So we have Pilate who's saying, I have found nothing wrong, nothing wrong with this man to a point where there's a mob. But now they hand him over and now he's hanging on that cross. It said, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Don't you fear, do you hear what he just called him? Don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. I want to ask you a question. How does this man know that? There is no record of him being in the synagogue with Jesus. There's no record of him walking with Jesus. There's no record of him seeing Jesus and what he's done. But he's looking at him and he sees something different. And he's saying, this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Hold on a second. Whose kingdom? He's saying your kingdom. He doesn't say, remember me when you go to, to God. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. But then it goes on. And it says, it, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, giving us direct access to God. Don't you ever ever believe that you have to go through another human being in order to get to God. Please, please. You don't need to confess to anyone in order to gain forgiveness except to Jesus. That's it. Okay? I just want to make that clear. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last breath. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Do you see his track record, church? Pilate saying, I found nothing wrong. The criminal hanging next to Jesus. I have seen this man is righteous. But not only that, the centurion, the guard that is there to kill Jesus, looks back and is like, surely that man was righteous. Look at his track record. Track record is huge, church. Jesus was perfect. He was, he was tempted like all of us, but he, he beat it. He was, he was perfect. Paul writes, He who knew no sin became sin so we could become like the righteousness of Jesus. Pilate knew. The moms who brought the babies to Jesus knew. Have you ever, you ever um, babies and dogs, if, if, if a baby or a dog doesn't like you, I don't either. I'm sorry, church. If they don't, if they don't trust you, if they don't trust you, 
And then there's, I, there, there's one person that Russell, our sweetest golden retriever, one person that he does not like. There's something off about him. I, won't, they, I, I don't know what it is. But the babies knew. The moms knew. Pilot knew. The thief on the cross knew. The centurion knew. And I want to ask you, what will you do with this Jesus? Third, to close. So I have his teachings. I have his track record. And church, I want to explain to you that for two years I tried to prove that Jesus was, was false. That he wasn't real. And I look at the track record and I'm like, oh, man. But the third thing that sealed the deal for me was the tomb. It was the tomb. You know, back in the times of Jesus, it was almost a requirement that you buy a tomb for your kids, for yourself. And it was a reminder that you're, this is a short stay on earth that you will be buried there in the ground. And they would buy a tomb for their kids. They would buy a tomb for themselves. And it would be reserved and it would be ready. Do you know that Jesus never bought a tomb? Do you know Mary never bought a tomb for Jesus? Do you know Joseph never bought a tomb for Jesus? Why? Because he didn't need to buy a tomb. He just needed to borrow it. That was it. He needed to borrow the tomb. The, the, this tomb, this, this empty tomb, where they go after three days and Pilate stationed guards at the tomb because they were fearful of his disciples stealing his body. So they put a seal on the stone knowing if that seal is broken, someone was in there. So they had guards stationed. And what's wild to me is that there is more record by even non-believers of that tomb being empty than there is about the forefathers of this country that we have here. There is record of that tomb being empty and the guards receiving payment to say that the disciples came and stole them. There's also stories that we didn't kill him. He didn't die. And he got up and he walked seven miles to Emmaus. Are you kidding me? Church, really? With nails that were dug into his feet and in his hand, he just got up after three days and walked seven miles? No. The tomb was empty. Why? Because Jesus said all of his teachings, all of his track record led to this moment of, I'm going to rise from the dead and defeat death. This tomb, this tomb is where I was transferred to from uh, God is just this far off being and, and Jesus was a good man to, to Jesus was God. And what's crazy is that all other religions, all other beliefs, they go and they visit the graves of their God or their prophets. They go and visit and we can't do that, church. Sure, we can go to the tombs. So they're in Israel, when we go to Israel, and I'm so excited whenever we go to Israel, there's three popular places where the tomb could be, and I'm going to visit all three. But let me tell you, that's not where my Jesus is. My Jesus is right here. Because he moved from, from sitting there to just being something, someone who didn't even care about me. To this, man, this personal relationship. And I think, man, without the tomb, we're just a bunch of Christians in locked rooms. That's it. Because on Silent Saturday, that's what they were doing. They were fearful. And they, they locked the doors. But with the rising, the empty tomb, man, it's not about a building. It's about, this is the, the most, if this story is true, I want you to sit on this. If you're, if you're on the fence, if this story is true, it's the most important thing in the world. Man, God was here? Yeah. For how long? About 33 years. Wait, but his ministry was only three years. Yeah. For 30 years, he didn't, we don't know much about him. What do you think he was doing? 
Well, his dad was a carpenter. Joseph was a carpenter. So you think he was probably in the shop making tables? Probably. You think he was sanding them? Just hanging out with his family? Probably. Can you imagine breaking news? God is here. People ask me, hey Matt, why aren't you doing church like regular church? And my response is, I'm acting like Jesus rose from the dead. I'm acting like this is true. If you want a Sunday morning pastor, this is not the church for you. Because God changed my life in a moment. I am a man who is in love with him. And I just want all of you to know him. That's, that's my goal in life is for you to know him. That's it. That's it. All of you to know him. He's no longer in the tomb. He is right here. If it's true, I want us to act like it's true. I want us to love like it's true. I want us to believe like it's true. I want us to face pain like it's true. I want us to face hurt like it's true. I want us to, to realize the resurrection is true because look at this last verse that we have. If you don't think Jesus is God, we're going to Revelation. You're like, well, we're finally in Revelation. See, I'll give you a little bit of Revelation. When I saw him, this is John talking about Jesus. When I saw him, I fell at his feet and as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and Hades. This is my Jesus where he comes in triumphant and he's saying, I have the keys of heaven and hell. That only God can do this. Only God can say I was the first and I'm the last and I'm going to end with this. After two years, man, I had some hard talks with Jesus. And it started off by this. Why do you love me? Like, really, why do you love me? And I just felt this overwhelming sense that Jesus is in, was, was living inside of me, but I had tough questions for him. And Jesus handled every tough question I had, and I said, God, God, why all the pain? And he said, son, you may not understand the pain this side of eternity, but I, my, my, my plans are great. My love for you is better. And then I would say, okay, this love, that you have. Man, don't you know what I did last night? I still love you, son. But God, how could you love somebody like me? Because when I look at you, I see the face of Jesus. But I'm nothing like Jesus. I know, I know, son, but Jesus is living inside of you. And then he asks, he's like, what do you feel? What do you feel when I'm around? I'm like, man, I, like I have a purpose. Like I have a direction. Like I feel love. And he said, can any religion do that for you? No, I was just taught that I had to work to get to you. He says, I'm already here, son. I'm already here. Jesus didn't give his life so we could play church. Jesus gave his life so that every single day we can wake up and say, man, I am so undeserving. He has become my king, church. He's become my king. And when you think a king, you may think of this, this ruler that's saying, now you have to do all this and this and this. And I look at him and I say, I get to do this. I get to be with you. 
God, I don't understand why you would want to be with someone like me. And he said, because I created you, son. Will you accept that? Will you believe in that? And that's when it, when it finally clicked where I have, I have family. I have someone who loves me no matter what I've ever done in my past, and he fills in all of that brokenness, church. And he cares about every pain that I've ever felt. And he's, he cares about any person that has tried pushing me away from him. And he said, I'll never do that. I'm never going to leave you. God, what about, what about 2009? What God told me was, would you be up on a stage right, ne- right now telling people about Jesus if 2009 didn't happen? Probably not. So can you trust me, son? It's hard. There's times where I think it my, my way is better. Church, I want you to get personal with Jesus. Don't say the things you feel like you have to say. Say the things that are really on your heart because then you realize not only is Jesus God, but he really, really, really loves you. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we can look at your teachings that are still relevant today We thank you that your track record was perfect. That so many came against you, but they found no fault in you. We thank you for the empty tomb, Lord. Because of the empty tomb is why we are here today instead of locked in rooms. Father, I pray that this becomes personal for even just one person today to realize that that gap is bridged that you are here right now. That you are with us. Father, I pray that this message penetrates the hearts of people who believe that that you just aren't around. That you just don't care. But the empty tomb is proof that you care. And Father, you also believe that this is This grace is scandalous that all we have to do is believe in our heart and speak with our lips that you are God, that you are King, that you are Lord over our life, that we turn to you. And by turning, Lord, you change everything. That all we have to do is say yes to Jesus. If this is your first time today saying yes to a personal personal relationship with Jesus. I want to pray for you with all eyes closed. Would you raise your hand? Does anyone want this? Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you could be here with us. Lord, that we don't have to do anything to get to you except be open to you and you change our way of living. Lord, I pray that all of this structure of religion is just thrown out when it comes to who you are as a personal Savior for each and every one of us. And God, let us remember that today. In Jesus' name.
forgiveness of all sins because the Bible said without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin so he was the ultimate sacrifice so today if you want to if you feel this need to come forward and grab it you can sit with your family and take communion together and Nate has a beautiful song and I want to pray over this and I want to assure you that this is personal and as you take this, I want you to ask yourself, do I have this personal connection with Jesus? And if I don't, why? And if it's hurt and pain that you're feeling, or you've been roadblocked by religion, can you please, as you're doing this, have a conversation with Jesus and explain all the pain, all the hurt, all of the, all of the the walls that had been built up. And as you take this, remember that he died for all of that because it says it is finished. Father, I pray over this, these elements. I pray over this cup, which represents the blood that was shed for us. I pray for this bread, Lord, that, that represents the body that you gave freely for us. And I pray, Lord, for the softening of hearts to realize that you want to get personal with them. So personal that you gave your life. And you didn't ask us to remember your birth. You asked us to do this in remembrance of your death. Because it was the death, the burial, and the resurrection that changed everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Come forward as you see today.
moving and forcing, I was shaking by and forth, broken and forgotten, feeling lost and lonely. The sun and thy king, and to the master's court, in thy savior, cradle in his arms. Carried to the table. See the man, I don't belong. I was carried to the table. Swept away by his knife. And I don't see my boldness anymore. When I'm seated at the table of the Lord, I'm carrying to the table. The table of the Lord. If I am not so fair, wonder why you call my name. Am I good enough to share this cup? This world is not in vain. Even in my weakness, I see you call my name. In his only presence, I hear the Lord of the shame. I'm carried to the table. I see you where I don't belong. I'm carried to the table. To rain by his love. I don't see my brokenness anymore. When I'm carried at the table of the Lord, I'm carried to the table. The table of the Lord. I don't see my brokenness anymore. When I'm seated at the table of the Lord, I carry to the table. The table of the Lord. The Lord. I just felt the. Uh... This message put on my heart. There's some people in here that need to have that hard conversation with God. That things have happened in your life that you can't explain and it's pushed you away. I've said some things in my life to God that only Him and I can handle, and I won't share it with anybody else, but He accepted it. We grew from it, and I realized how great He is. So if you need to have that talk, I want you to get extremely personal with Jesus. Ask him about the pain. Ask him about the hurt. Thank him for the blessings, the miracles. Just talk with him. God bless the church.